Uh, good morning. Thanks for coming to CSIS. My name is Jim Lewis. Uh, we're going to start our event. Our speakers are here. They're just looking for mics, so don't worry about that. Um, export controls can really make a difference when it comes to national security, but uh, we know from experience that out-of-date export controls can cost billions in exports and thousands in jobs without any security benefit. Um, if you get export controls wrong, if you don't take into account how the international economy has changed, um, they can actually do some damage. So it's a step forward, a big step forward, that uh, we've seen this export control reform effort come to fruition. The people on the stage and their predecessors have struggled to get export controls right, and they've made remarkable progress that we'll hear about today. Here's the format. Um, we will begin with remarks by Carolyn Atkinson, Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor for Economic Affairs. Carolyn has to leave promptly, and she'll be followed by this panel, chaired by my colleague Stephanie Sanuk. It's Kevin Wolf, Tom Kelly, Brian Nielsen, Hugh Hoffman, and Craig Healy. Stephanie will introduce them. We'll take questions after the panel. I'm not going to read Carol's bio because that would take up about half the session. Uh, it's too distinguished to cover. Uh, it is available on our website, but she has been special assistant to the President for International Economic Affairs since 2011 and is now the Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics. Long career, sort of amazing. I don't think we've ever had anyone from the uh, Bank of England speak here before, so thank you very much. Um, with that, let me turn it over to her. Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks very much, Jim, and to all of you. And uh, you're not surprised with that Bank of England introduction to hear my accent. Although I've spent more than half my life in the US, apparently beyond a certain age, you don't, uh, uh, you don't uh, change the accent. And I was also born here, but anyway. Um, so I'm delighted to be here to talk about this issue. My colleague, Brian Nilsson, who knows a to Z and every letter in between and all the subcategories will be on the panel and able to take up uh, more of your, of your questions and let you know about his work, which has been tremendous in this effort for my predecessor, Mike Froman, and also for me. Uh, and whilst export controls may not be at the forefront of most people's minds, I can report that they certainly appear to be at the forefront of Brian's mind, and he makes sure that they are an important issue for the rest of us, including myself. Um, they actually, as you all probably know well, have a far-reaching impact on uh, U.S. businesses, large and small, and it's really important and being made clear to all of us how important it is to modernize this aspect of our uh, control system to make sure that it's both comprehensive and comprehensible. Uh, it's the only way that we can make sure that we are engaging in safe trade that helps our men and women overseas, but also, uh, as Jim referred to it, we're not doing things that could actually uh, harm uh, our safety. That means that export controls need to be really carefully calibrated so as to meet defense and non-proliferation objectives without uh, undermining them. That means also that they have to be flexible Threats change, technology changes. We need an export control system that's nimble enough to adjust to these changes. And that's why back in 2009, very early on in uh, the first um, term of, of President Obama, he directed the National Security Council and the National Economic Council to stand up a comprehensive review of our export control system and put forward a set of recommendations, and by the way, to start implementing them, to ensure that it's designed to meet uh, our national security and non-proliferation objectives. Now, you might say, what's the National Economic Council got to do with it? And by the way, I, I have a dual report to uh, both elements of, of the White House on, on economics. And that's because our national security requirements in the 21st century cover much more than uh, a broader array of areas than in the past. Uh, it's our commercial sector, unlike in the t much of the 20th century, and not our military that is fueling the development of the next generation of technologies. Uh, that was a key finding in the national intelligence estimate that we conducted at the outset of the export control reform process. And that was, in fact, the first national intelligence estimate done on export controls and one that has guided us as we've done the reform. 
Uh, you may have heard this, but I want to just repeat the sort of three-part mantra about uh, export control reform and the a reason for it. The first is it helps to us to focus our resources in this area on the threats that matter most. The work that we've already done on rewriting our export control lists provides the flexibility that I said is needed to prioritize our controls. Because uh, not all items, not all end users, and not all end uses pose the same risks. We need the flexibility to adjust controls, not a wholesale decontrol, but the flexibility. Two, export control reform will increase interoperability with our allies. As we've seen in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, our military operates in a coalition with our allies. We need to be interoperable with those allies if we are to improve their effectiveness and uh, increase and ensure our troops' collective security. So we need to be able to work jointly together more effectively on programs that we're developing jointly. Third, export control reform strengthens the U.S. defense industrial base. It reduces incentives for foreign manufacturers to replace UN, U.S. origin uh, content with foreign origin content, simply to avoid our export control system. And there are two elements, two reasons for the, uh, that, that make this last point so important. The first is that we do need uh, people back home making these items so that we maintain the expertise and are able to uh, meet our own future needs in this area. Uh, and yes, an element of that is uh, maintaining and expanding US jobs to sustain economic security. But the second is that uh, the trend of replacing US origin content with foreign made items means that our controls are diminished as, uh, as others go around them, and our visibility in the movement of items, -sen less sensitive ones, but still important ones, is, uh, is reduced. So that is a serious unintended consequence of, uh, of past export, of the existing export control system, and something that we, w that we certainly have in mind during the reforms. Let me just tell you briefly about where we are in the reforms. We've made huge strides in the past year, moving from planning to implementation. Uh, in the lingo, that means that we are now in the second phase of our three-phase implementation work plan. We have to finish this second phase before we consider the third and final phase of uh, legislation to consolidate our licensing and enforcement agencies. And we've made some adjustments to the 2010 work plan that first laid this out, primarily to add new items to the matrix that we determined needed to be done, whilst also focusing our energies first and foremost on the most urgent uh, changes needed. We're, uh, I'm glad to say that we are now approaching the completion of rewriting the munitions list, which is the cornerstone of the effort to date. Uh, our first final categories have gone into effect. They went into effect last October for aircraft, gas turbine engines, classified articles and miscellaneous. And four more went into effect in January for vessels, military vehicles, auxiliary military equipment, and submersibles. These eight categories out of many account for over $75 billion in exports under license, which is a the, the uh, bulk. We published another five categories in January that will go into effect in the summer, including launch vehicles and missiles, explosives, military training, and protective equipment that account for another $5 billion in exports. And the panel will be able to uh, update you on how it's been going since we began. We now have some experience of operating under the new system with the first rules having gone into effect several months ago. These changes mean that uh, over half of the categories, 13 out of 21 in the munitions list, have been published in final form. And those 13 categories altogether account for almost 90% of our export licensing, over $80 billion in actual exports a year, or 450,000 jobs in the United States. So what, what's next up? Um, our priority in 2014 is to finish uh, the work on the munitions list, 
And our priority categories for rules uh, now are in the queue are for publication are satellites, electronics, and chemicals. And our goal is to have all the remaining proposed and final rules published this year. Now, other priorities are to continue the work that has been ongoing, but more kind of behind the scenes. Capacity building for the multi-agency Export Enforcement Coordination Center that's already made big inroads into using our export enforcement assets better and building better cases. At the same time, we're continuing the transition to a single licensing database which will enhance our ability to provide more timely decisions and, importantly, more informed ones. And uh, as one finds in so many uh, parts of life with new technology, uh, there are huge gains to be made from centralizing and making a single um, database, but there are also huge complications in getting there. I'm pleased to report that by um, the spring of this year, quite soon, we expect that the Commerce Department will join the system, will be on the system, so that the three largest departments involved in this area, Defense, State, and Commerce, will all be on a single platform. Now, there's still a lot of work to be done um, as we complete the munitions list this year. Key priorities are more technical work on the definition and scope of various control issues and the definition of uh, specific categories of what's subject to control and what's not. So uh, again, as all of you will know um, better than I and more deeply than I, how do we define terms such as public domain, publicly available, what's technical, what's technology, what's fundamental research, as we're seeking to, <coughs> to define what is and is not within the scope of our controls. And we're also planning to turn to some harder issues, notably in encryption, cloud computing, and cybersecurity, and to begin planned changes in both the state and commerce regulations, including a comprehensive review of commerce's export administration regulations, of which the commerce control list is just a part, I think a relatively small part. So finally, I just want to say, and again, you all know this, that from the beginning of this reform effort, we have done, I believe, and certainly want to do all our work in a very transparent and open way, and we plan for that to continue. The progress that we've made has been uh, crucially dependent on input from you in industry, from NGOs, from think tanks, and our international partners. And we will need your continued support and input to help us work through the challenging priorities uh, that, that are still ahead of us. So thank you very much. I'm really sorry that I have to run out. Uh, it's a bit of a crazy day, as uh, they mostly seem to be, and I'm uh, catching a plane this afternoon to, uh, to Moscow. Um, thank you for inviting me. I want to, uh, you to be um, sort of certain, I was going to say reassured, I hope reassured, that uh, export control reform remains a priority for the president. And I look forward to working with you, as well as with my colleagues, with all of you, to bring this reform effort to a successful conclusion, and thereby bolstering America's uh, national and economic security. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Carol. No one willingly goes to Moscow in February, so we know it's a hardship tour. Uh, what I'd like to do now is turn the event over to Stephanie Sanat Castro, my colleague here at CSIS, who will chair the panel. There will be time for questions at the end, and these people certainly will be able to answer almost anything you can think to ask. <laughs> Stephanie. Thanks, Jim. As he mentioned, um, I'm a colleague of his here at CSIS. I'm the acting director for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, and I am an, a senior fellow in the International Security Program. And I have the distinct pleasure of having worked export control issues, both um, in the Department of Defense and on the Hill. Um, we didn't get very far, and I'm very curious to hear um, our panelists' perspectives on, on how far they have come and where they intend to go. As you can see, we have several panelists. I'm amazed that the federal government allowed their schedules to, uh, to align. Um, we're going to go in a particular order. Um, I'm first going to introduce um, Brian Nielsen. Um, he is, as you all know, or if you've been involved in this for any length of time, um, 
kind of the guru at the White House for non-proliferation non export controls, national security. And he's been leading this export control reform initiative. Um, he's been at the NSC and now the NSS um, since 2008. Um, and so if you have any questions regarding what's happened over time, I'm sure he's, he's the man to go to. He will be followed by um, Acting Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs, Tom Kelly. He is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, um, and he joined the Bureau of um, PM in August 2011, right when we were getting into the thick of these things. Uh, he oversees overall Bureau operations and directly supervises the Office of Security Negotiations and Agreements, the Office of the Coordinator for Counter Piracy and Maritime Security, and the Office of the Coordinator for the Foreign Policy Advisors Program. He's been in government since 1985. Talk about longevity. Um, he'll be followed by Tony Hoffman, who is a Deputy Director at the Defense Technology Security Administration. He is a member of the Senior Executive Service, and he's been in this position um, for, I believe, two years, Tony, is that correct? That's correct. Um, before he, assuming this position, he has spent quite a bit of time uh, in all parts of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, but he was also the Director of Security Cooperation Reform. So any of our foreign visitors from embassies and elsewhere who have particular questions about um, foreign assistance and, and export control and the overlap, I'm, I'm sure we can direct your questions to him. Fourth up will be Craig Healy, who's the Director of the Export Enforcement Coordination Center. Um, he was appointed director on September 12th, 2011, and he serves also as a Deputy Assistant Director for the ICE, or the um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Counterproliferation Investigations Program. And he can tell us a little bit more about enforcement of the um, ECRI, that aspect of the ECRI. And batting cleanup is the man who lives and breathes this stuff every day, is Kevin Wolf. Secretary Wolf uh, has been the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration since February 19th, 2010. Prior to joining the Obama administration, he was a partner in the office of Brian Cave, LLP, and he spent 17 years with that firm covering most aspects of the law and policy regarding international trade. He's very familiar <coughs> with all of our um, three and four letter acronyms when it comes to export control, everything from the export administration reg regulations to ITAR, to sanctions administered under the Office of Foreign Assets Control, anti boycott, you name it, I think Kevin yeah, can, sure. can field a question on it. So without further ado, I will turn the microphone over to uh, Brian Nielsen. Thank you. And I'm actually going to pass the baton to my colleague Tom, um, since Carolyn's already given you a little bit of the overview of the White House perspective. And so I am here to help two questions at the end. So with that, I will turn it over to Tom. OK, thanks, Brian. Uh, yep. It's uh, great to be here uh, this morning. As Acting Assistant uh, Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, uh, I run the bureau that handles the bulk of the work that's done at the State Department on export control uh, reform. So uh, I just want to say a few words about the uh, State Department's perspective on uh, this important administration initiative. When it comes to implementing export control reform, uh, the administration is focused on creating an export control system that, that keeps pace with new technologies and supply chain globalization. At the same time, uh, we don't want the process to sacrifice critical national security and foreign policy objectives from non-proliferation uh, to supporting human rights. Export control reform, as, uh, as Caroline has, uh, has uh, indicated, is going to streamline U.S. government decision making on strategic exports and create a more transparent and predictable system. What it won't do is uh, alter the primacy of foreign policy in the decision-making process uh, for arms exports. Our foreign military sales program, direct commercial sales authorizations, and all exports of munitions from the United States are still going to be authorized based on a coordinated review of foreign policy risks and rewards that are associated with the transaction. Our newly revised and publicly available conventional arms transfer policy guides this review. It affirms that the United States doesn't simply allow arms to flow from its border in response to, to global uh, demand. We authorize exports that support U.S. Fo foreign policy and national security objectives. 
Uh, as Dr. Atkinson indicated, uh, we've achieved the first milestones in implementing export control reform over the past several months. In October uh, 2013, the first major revision to the export control list went into effect, transferring controls on certain aircraft and gas turbine engines, as well as their parts and components from the control of the Department of State to the Department of Commerce. These two categories alone potentially ex uh, represent uh, more than $20 billion in annual exports. And this January, new controls on military vehicles and ships uh, went into effect. Our allies and partners are responding very positively to these changes and uh, I think see many of their concerns related to security of supply uh, addressed by the administration's initiative. And uh, we're finding that the U.S. defense export community is also supportive of this, this initiative. Uh, while I have the floor, though, I, I do want to take this opportunity uh, once again to dispel the myth that export control reform uh, equals decontrol of arms exports. Any item uh, going forward that's no longer controlled by the U.S. munitions list is now controlled by the commerce control list. Our goal at the end of the day is an agile, dynamic export control regime that's responsive to today's and tomorrow's national security and foreign policy challenges. These new controls are going to reduce bureaucracy, they're going to accelerate goods to market for close allies and security partners, and they're still going to maintain a very high level of scrutiny uh, over arms exports. Though the full measure of our success uh, remains ahead of us, uh, we're very confident that we're on the right track. Thanks a lot. Good morning, everybody. I, uh, I'm Tim Hoffman. I'm the deputy director at DITSA. Uh, I've, uh, I've had the, the pleasure of working um, several perspectives on arms export, both uh, from uh, from a security assistance point of view, uh, working uh, actually in country in Iraq and then uh, work running the Secretary of Defense's Security Cooperation Reform Task Force and then a number of other things tied to, to how we deal with partners and allies around the world. So it's a, I think I bring a slightly different perspective than perhaps the, the normal export control person. As we've gone through this whole exercise, it's important to remember this started off, it was initiated by Secretary Gates and this was a he had really big concerns about how we support our allies and, and achieve our national security objectives and balance the kind of competing goals that we have set for ourselves in this country. Just to remind you, there's really three things. We want to protect our war fighting edge of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. We want to build partnership capacity, and that includes interoperability with our allies and partners who, who either act in our place or act with us in, in, a, in a number of places around the world. And finally, we want uh, to promote uh, the defense industry's uh, 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 health and, uh, and vigor. Uh, all three of them are important, and as you might imagine, occasionally they're in tension with each other. and so. For us, as we have designed these categories and, and rewritten the controls, it's really been a balancing act between these various and sundry uh, competing goals that we have. Some, when they're aligned, that's a great thing. When they're not aligned, we have to really think through the risks uh, and the opportunities uh, tied to uh, how we weight the consideration of each of the three. One of the things that's really driving us in this regard has been um, the increasing uh, movement of the commercial sector into technologies, advanced technologies, that have been historically the purview of the military. And that's really how the USML grew up separately from the CCO. So, so what we're seeing here in terms of another balance or another tension is how we balance things that are increasingly dual use. Uh, we've gone through this thing we call the bright line exercise, which is to describe clear controls that delineate between what's commerce uh, and what's a, a state-controlled item. Um, that's not always an easy thing, and, it, and why is it not an easy thing? Oftentimes, it's, uh, it's very hard to draw the line between what's, what's the thing that we care about the most about some of these dual-use items and what bring some of these items onto the ITAR side and what brings some of these things to the CCL side. So 
what's really critical about this, and it's really driven us to, is define what it is, the quintessence of what we're trying to control. And as recently as yesterday and the day before, we've had some very earnest discussions about what it is. What is it that we're trying to control in certain key industries? And so, as you might imagine, military electronics and fire control and those sorts of things, uh, where the, the items are, uh, of there's an increasing market in the commercial sector for these things. And as the, the military requirements go down, there's going to be increasing pressure for us to think about this. So then that drives us to the next issue is, as, as the commercial sector demand for some of these things, say night vision cameras for cars, for example, that's driven us to start thinking about, um, is, is this going to be a permanent control or not? And, and the answer, I think, clearly is no, that we really have to think through this export control set of regulations as being a dynamic, living product. Uh, so what you're going to see, I think, over time is something that's not unlike what we do with some of the other arms control regimes around the world, is that we're going to have to revisit these controls because the threshold for military, the threshold between the military and the commercial side is going to raise, and we're going to have to rethink what exactly is a military thing over time, or whether we want to continue to control some things on the ITAR. This, con this trend will only continue. Um, so uh, this is driving us to move much more technology to the AR. In my mind, that's a good thing. Um, and what it's doing to us, I think, is really important for you all to understand out there is that we're, we're increasingly less concerned about whether something's ITAR or EAR, EAR and more concerned about how it's controlled and who it goes to. And so, in my mind, this is taking us increasingly towards convergence between the two regulations. We're not there yet, but what we're really increasingly thinking about is, is um, how best to control these things to, to protect national security interests and, at the same time, uh, promote industrial health and protect our war fighting edge. So, um, that's, that's, those are the tensions. The good stuff that's happening right now is that I think we're seeing convergence. Three years of working together has caused us to work through controls on both sides of the, both sides of the house, the EAR and the ITAR. And those dialogues, in terms of defining the, the bright line, has caused us to come, to come to one mind about thinking about what things are ITAR and what things are EAR. That's a very, very healthy thing. I will not tell you that all the arguments have been um, non-contentious. They have been, and, and, but steel sharpens steel. And I think over time, in most of the categories, and almost all the categories, we've come to a, a, a consensus on where those lines are and, and that those lines are in good places for now. So that's, that's one of the things that's really important. And what that collaboration does for us is builds trust and confidence in each other. Uh, and what we find is that we're acting, I think, in my opinion, much more holistically than perhaps we were uh, acting in a, a couple of years ago. A specific example of that is collaboration on the items that have moved to the CCL, the, the so-called 600 series paragraph items. Uh, what we're seeing right now that uh, Commerce has created uh, uh, a new office that we work very closely with, and they have been uh, very generous in, uh, in seeking our guidance and, and counsel on, uh, on commodity classifications, and in my view, that, that's been a very healthy relationship. Again, we don't always agree on everything, but the fact that we're having this dialogue, uh, constant, constant back and forth, has brought us to closer convergence on what it is we're trying to protect and why. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about, Caroline mentioned the U.S. exports system. We are, uh, we are now working through the commerce side of the house. The state is up and running. I think it's running satisfactorily for all parties that are involved in that right now. Uh, with relatively few glitches. One of the things that we're going to do with U.S. exports for the commerce side is to, to address export enforcement. So that's a new feature of this, and so that's, a, that's something that we've had to work through in terms of how the whole system is going to work with that. Uh, my understanding is state likes that and it, it may want to go back and pursue that later on with their own enforcement system as we, we go to uh, subsequent versions of this. Um, the great thing about U.S. exports is it, it helps us get a common operating picture of what's going on out in the export view. It forces us to rapidly staff and have uh, rapid decisions on, on certain kinds of things. And so that's very, very important for 
for us as a community to be able to do that much more quickly. And when commerce comes online, I think uh, we'll get even better. So where are we? Um, we think uh, once we have commerce online, the next steps will be to build a single portal and a single license application, which will make life, I think, or we hope, easier for, for the industry out there so that they come in with a single license and then we can, we can help them thread the ne needle as to where that license goes and how, how, that, how that license passes through the system. So I guess if I were going to use one word on all this collaboration, is it's, it's the term convergence. We are actually converging on, a, I think, a, a USG holistic view of things and, and getting a common picture and a common agreement on, on how we approach uh, export controls. So we, in summary, we've come a long way over the last couple of years. Um, we still have a long way to go. Uh, there's been lots of cooperation, great collaboration, and that's probably been the most heartening thing for me in my experience. Uh, in the past has been that, uh, that the interagency was just another, another word for gridlock, and, and that's not been the case here. I, this has been as collaborative and a, and a cooperative group as I've ever worked with. Um, so I think I would agree with Tom, we're undoubtedly on the right path, and, well, and I'll just leave it at that, and uh, I'll be happy to take your comments afterwards. Good morning, everyone. Well, my name is Craig Healy. I'm with the Department of Homeland Security, and I'm also the director of the Export Enforcement Coordination Center. I would just like to echo some of the comments that you've heard from some of our panelists. What we're trying to do is basically trying to bring people together within the enforcement community. It's not just about any one particular agency. It's about how all those agencies can work together for the collective betterment of the U.S. government towards accomplishing our objectives. President Obama issued Executive Order 13558, creating the, what we call the E2C2 in November of 2010 as part of the administration's Export Control Reform Initiative. Officially operational in March 2012, E2C2 is a multi-agency center that has approximately 19 federal agencies representing nine governmental departments. We have the Homeland Security, Commerce, Defense, State, Energy, Justice, Treasury, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. As Dr. Atkinson mentioned earlier, we have been doing our, our work behind the scenes, and what I would like to do this morning is just kind of give you a little bit of a snapshot of some of the things that we've been working on within our community. What we realized is that we needed to establish some metrics to be able to demonstrate that the interagency coordination center was going in the direction that we needed to go. So what we did was we conducted an informal, unscientific, these were done by law enforcement, so you know it was unscientific, uh, survey relative to the people that we have been working with. Predominantly, since we've received no resources to open this center, we've been working primarily on deconfliction protocols amongst the interagency. And a deconfliction protocol is how can you turn around and make sure that you have a basic amount of transparency so that you'd be able to share and make sure that you can collaborate with your partners if the opportunity presents itself? So what we did was at the end of our first year, we took the total number of deconfliction referrals that we've done for our first year. That accounted for 1,126 referrals. Of that 1,126, 673, or approximately 60%, were what we call positive deconfliction referrals. And when I say positive, that doesn't mean necessarily that multiple agencies are working that, that referral. It just means that when you take that information and you pass it amongst this diverse community, there are other entities who have information which is relevant to your inquiry. So what we did from there was we turned around and said, well, let's try to drill down a little bit more. Of these 673 positive deconflictions, we were able to attribute them to 191 participants. Clearly, some of the participants have submitted multiple deconfliction requests. So we look at that 191 participants. Out of those 191 surveys that were sent out, 158 participants responded, so we had roughly an 83% response rate, which is positive. What were the takeaways from the survey? When provided with a positive deconfliction response, E2C2 users contacted their interagency points of contact 85% of the time. 
Upon contacting their interagency point of contact, E2C2 users received information that was relevant to their investigation 72% of the time. And most importantly is this third metric. When an E2C2 user receives relevant information from an interagency point of contact, 23% of the time, a joint investigation goes forth and sues. And lastly, 8% of the respondents reported a conflict when they were going through the deconfliction process. So clearly, that 92% is happy with the way things are progressing. Now, as I reel this off to you and kind of give you an idea of some of the things that we're working on, I want to be perfectly clear. We're a very immature organization. We are, start our third year in March 2012. We are not in the process of taking over export enforcement. We are simply like other government fusion centers, coordination centers, trying to take our community and trying to get our community to better engage, be a little bit more transparent, and try to figure out ways that we can work together. Now, as of last week, we still have, well, as of last week, we're up to 2,600 referrals, and we're hovering at a 56% positive deconfliction ratio. So to me, that's a proof of concept that when you take people who basically work within a very similar community and you give those people an opportunity to exchange and share information with one another, positive things can result from that. We're a long way from realizing the full objectives of Executive Order 13558. But like law enforcement, like the law enforcement community at large, we are all severely strong sometimes by our lack of resources. We all have an opportunity here to figure out how can we partner together to collectively work with our interagency partners and move the export control reform enforcement ball forward. So again, I don't have an awful lot to report to you, but I wanted to let you know that our partners are extremely engaged behind the scenes. We're seeing some very good opportunities for some joint investigations to come forward. We've had some success stories and we'll continue to push the, the envelope forward along with our interagency partners. Thank you. So to back clean up and then I'll be available for questions. Um, I think when my, my role is to make this system at the commerce side work. And essentially what we're doing is moving from a control structure on the defense trade side where everything is controlled equally always all the time. Uh, there are a few exceptions here and there, but essentially when you have control text where all parts or components are controlled the same way and are controlled merely by virtue of being specifically designed and modified for another defense article and they have the same level of control to them, that's on one hand very simple. Um, uh, and there's, there's a virtue in that, but the downside of it is that it over controls and harms the national security objectives that we were describing uh, so well earlier and conflict with the instructions of Secretary Gates um, uh, that we described. So inevitably what you have to do is go from that simple system of one sentence that controls everything equally, always, all the time, everywhere, and start going through and, as Tim described, um, uh, asking ourselves what are the types of items that even for ultimate end use by the governments of our NATO and other close allies uh, that there should be a State Department license for on a case-by-case -case basis, and what are the types of items for those end users and those end uses and those destinations um, uh, for which a license exception uh, uh, can be available, maintaining the controls on the rest of the world and the embargoes at the status quo level. And inevitably, when you start moving in that direction to accomplish that broader, bigger picture policy goal, complexity results. And, and, and I realize that that is difficult for companies, and I realize that that has been difficult for us to draft. So our role is to accomplish that objective, moving to uh, basically more words that are more tailored, uh, but in a way that eventually uh, everyone will understand and that are straightforward. So the general reaction that I'm getting from industry, and it, it's sort of multiple phases, you know, after they have discovered what we're up to, and they get over the initial panic about you know, the paradigm shift and how to think about what's controlled where and how and get used to you know, another department getting involved in another set of regulations. Once they work through that, eventually from all of our experience so far as this has been running for a couple of months, um, uh, it works, it becomes efficient, they do appreciate it. And when there are, here's the key point for you all, as mentioned earlier, this is an incredibly transparent process. You know, uh, we, uh, uh, 
when, you know, we're, we're all very smart, but occasionally we will miss things or not realize the implications of something. And we want to hear about it. And when we hear about it, when we realize that isn't exactly what we intended or that's what we wrote, but someone's reading it in a very different way than we thought, we can make adjustments. And as you know, a, a sort of a mantra and a spirit that's, that's fed into this uh, system is to be flexible. So, you know, so long as it accomplishes those broader national security and foreign policy objectives that were described earlier, we are trying to make the system more adaptive. And I think you will see that through a series of tweaks to the regulations over time and a regular review and an updating of what is a more detailed and complex list of items controlled how. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's the main point. What else uh, can I discuss? Oh, it's, it's more than just the categories as well. Uh, and uh, as was described, we're getting close to the next group of categories, which are satellites, uh, moving commercial, um, essentially commercial satellites and spacecraft uh, back to the Commerce Department and finishing up the cleanup of uh, the military electronics rule, which is part of our transparency objective. We went out uh, for yet a second proposed rule asking for industry input uh, on, and then we'll finish the remaining categories over the year. But it's also moving the two sets of regulations together. If, you know, the whole point of export controls is for government visibility and authorization for certain physical items, technology, uh, software, and services to particular end uses, end users, uh, and destinations. So they, the ITAR and the ER have that same objective with respect to those four types of things. And if, if uh, there's no difference, there's no policy reason for having a difference between them, then what we're trying to do is to get to similar words and phrases and interpretations and definitions so that exporters uh, don't have to struggle with trying to figure out that the ITAR interprets it one way and the ER interprets it uh, another way. If there is a reason for a difference, we should be transparent about it, which we're trying to get to for a difference, because they will still have a, um, you know, a different universe of what they're responsible for. And so you will be seeing over the course of 2014 and into 2015 a whole series of other changes to non-list, proposed changes, non-list base aspects of the two sets of regulations. Um, and that then will lead to the larger convergence. And then I'll just sort of end the point with what, you know, I consider one of the biggest successes of the effort, which is not so much of regulation, but it's cultural uh, within the government. And, you know, I, uh, I, each of them has said it, but, you know, relative to where, and I've been doing this for a long time, you know, where the agencies were when we started. And sure, yes, we don't always agree on all things all the time, but we're trying to see the export control system as an administration system, as opposed to a state system or a commerce system or defense having their own view. And when we disagree, we work it out so that there is a common view of one administration with the same objective because of the convergence of technologies, end uses and end users, ultimately to accomplish the larger foreign policy and national security objectives that were described before. So with that very general top level uh, observation uh, that it's working well, uh, uh, we're transparent and um, uh, we'll be adapting and adjusting to new issues as they come up, I'll end and leave it open for questions. Okay, now that I'm properly mic'd up, I can join my friends up here. If I can squeeze through, <laughs> sorry. Sure. I'm a bit bigger than I used to be. Um, Thank you all for your um, presentations and your willingness to be here and talk about this issue. Now, Tim Hoffman's comments about um, the DOD perspective really did harken back to Secretary Gates's April 2010 speech. It is, it's heartening to, to hear that the viewpoint really hasn't changed and you've made progress towards um, taking action, implementing rules, and, and moving forward. But I go back to sort of what is the purpose of export control reform, and, and we heard a little bit about it today, but in a State Department fact sheet last year, they had said it's threefold, really. It's one, to really focus resources on threats that matter. The second is increasing interoperability, which we've heard about. And the third is strengthening the U.S. industrial base. Now, when you raise ITAR and U.S. industrial base, um, you get a range of reactions from smirking to um, walking away in a huff, you know, from a lot of defense companies. Can you talk a little bit about, um, and I'm going to focus this question on Tom, can you talk a little bit about how this process does in fact strengthen the U.S. industrial base and what reactions State Department has heard in terms of, of um, how this is going over? Sure. Um, the, again, the, the focus of the reform is to try to enable uh, 
our, our regulators at the State Department to focus on the items that really matter to U.S. Uh, qualitative military edge. Uh, and that, uh, ipso facto, means that they're going to be focusing on a smaller universe uh, of items. Uh, so I, th I, I think it, uh, because our process is going, going to be more uh, transparent about what we really uh, care about and are focusing on in terms of our uh, qualitative military advantage, it gives industry uh, much greater transparency and predictability in knowing uh, what they are going to be able to, uh, to export and, and, and what is going, going to continue uh, uh, to be uh, restricted very closely. And we uh, believe that uh, that is going to make it much easier for, for industry uh, to, uh, uh, to produce and, and sell more all over the world. Uh, and that is going to, uh, you know, have very positive ancillary uh, effects on our defense industrial base uh, because they're going to be able to achieve economies of scale uh, and reduce unit costs, uh, which will make our industry more competitive globally and ensure that when we need industry, uh, or when our armed forces and our nation uh, need industry to be able to uh, produce certain lines, those production lines uh, will still be open. And uh, for that reason, we found that uh, the defense export community has been very supportive of uh, export control reform uh, initiative. Now, one thing that Secretary Gates did mention back in April of 2010, um, and it's no surprise because he was formerly affiliated with the university, was the issue of deemed exports. How does this process, um, and maybe I can ask Brian this question, how does this process um, treat deemed exports? Sure, happy to talk to that. Um, our deemed exports basically are our technology controls, and so those are actually not being diminished in any way because we're maintaining the controls even as we're moving items, as we're moving end items and the related software and technology from the munitions list to the commerce control list, they remain subject to the same controls. Okay. So, so basically, we're maintaining those controls for the purposes of deemed exports. Okay, thank you. Um, now, some of you may be aware that just under a month ago, the Congressional Research Service um, released a report, an update to a report on the export control system. And in their summary, they talked about clearly the rationalization of the USML and CCL has been going well. Um, and then interim steps have been taken to, as, I, as it says here, to create a single IT system and to establish an export enforcement agency. Um, they reported, though, that not a lot of work has been done on the single licensing agency issue. Um, how would you react to this um, CRS report? Well, Kevin? On that last topic, uh, we've got a lot of work to get done <laughs> yeah. uh, before we sort of bite off that larger institutional uh, transformation effort, which has been just, which is the phase three effort. So, as we said during a congressional hearing last week, last year, um, you know, let us get done with doing all that we have on our plate, which is a fairly full plate for 2014 before we dive into the much broader topic of achieving it. Is this all work that would need to be done anyway? You need to have sort of a common regulatory structure, a common definitional structure, uh, you know, a common understanding of what should be controlled where and how. So, you know, everything that we're doing actually will lead to that, but to the extent of taking the next step after we have the regulatory structure in place of accomplishing the phase three objectives, we'll get to it. There's just not enough manpower to do all those other things at the same time. Well, it's interesting that you talk about phase three. Some of, some of you mentioned it earlier. Um, I'm really curious about the congressional aspect of this because I know a lot of times um, suggestions from the executive branch may fall on deaf ears or there's a protracted, very long discussion um, between the two branches of government. And taking this you know, CRS report, they are usually generated by congressional either member or staff interest, yeah. and that's what they respond to. So can you talk a little bit about, Kevin, um, headway made with, with Congress. You mentioned you know, there is a cultural change happening, and that's also happening on the Hill, and, and a new openness to really discuss this kind of thing. Um, but you know, you've got a very, very partisan Congress. You've got people who um, do want to protect everything all the time, um, because they think that's in our nat national interest, versus people who you know, are, are pro-commerce, but also you know, well, let's build a high fence around a couple of things that we really need to build a fence around. 
So how are you all working with Congress? Um, this CRS report also mentions perhaps draft legislation in the works mm -hmm. that may be sent to Congress. Can you respond to that? Sure. Uh, as it's the same answer as before. We, let us get done first with the structural changes that we're making. Then right. we will get to the point of engaging on those other topics. Uh, so there's no change on that. With respect to working with Congress, uh, it's, it's right now it's primarily through the notification process that, you know, that the State Department is leading. When, whenever we come to a, uh, a new category, what we do is we send it up to Congress informally and then through uh, provision of the Arms Export Control Act requiring notification. And, and so we've been engaging them at every stage. You know, before we proposed any of the rules, we went up and we briefed the Hill completely informally before they became you know, even public as a proposed rule and have been working through and taking into account congressional staff interest. Uh, and that process uh, continues. So the, the way to the, the way to the congressional involvement right now is sort of on each stage of the effort, which sort of manifests itself in uh, each of the individual category reviews. I don't know, if Tom. Tom, do you have any other? Yeah, the the uh, the decision on on uh, whether to transfer an item from U.S. munitions list to uh, to the CCL, um, you know, involves a lot of different uh, variables. It's a complex decision, and that's why we have the kind of methodical consultation process. Uh, that Kevin just described, um, and, uh, and and we very much want Congress uh, to be a partner in this effort. Uh, I will say, as somebody who's who's uh, testified on the Hill on this issue, uh, that it's very striking to me uh, the amount of agreement uh, across uh, across the aisles on the Hill uh, on the importance of of this uh, initiative. I think that it's fair to say that there is a very broad support on the Hill. Uh, for what we're trying to achieve uh, in this initiative, uh, to you know, improve our national security, uh, help our uh, our uh, defense industrial base, um, that's something that that uh, that everybody on the Hill wants to achieve a as well. And there can be different perspectives on a particular item, but I think that the broad thrust of what we're trying to achieve here uh, has a great deal of support. Thank you for that. And Stephanie, if I may, I'll, I'll just add to that that, um, as Kevin has already said, and Tom, we've really worked uh, closely in a partnership with the Hill since the outset of, of the whole effort. And uh, one of the elements that we've done is that we go up as a team, whereas previously, okay. I mean, state would go up and brief the state oversight committees, commerce would go up and brief the commerce oversight committees. And so what we've been doing is, is we've actually sort of broadened uh, our outreach by going up as a team. So we're including all of the oversight committees for each of the agencies, which has been sort of spreading uh, the word on what we're doing on export control reform. Uh, we've also partnered with them in making several legislative changes of the class of the last three years, which we really needed. We actually, um, uh, we were able to harmonize the, uh, the criminal penalties to the same standardized maximum. Um, the, 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 uh, paradoxically, the, 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 the Arms Export Control Act had the lowest uh, criminal penalties for prison sentences, and so uh, it was only half that for, for commerce and for, um, and for treasury, and so we actually have harmonized that to the same standard, and that was done in a collaborative uh, uh, work with the Hill. Um, and we've also, in, in moving uh, legislation on satellites, that was... Um, as you know, that, that, that has a long and so somewhat tortured history. It does. Um, and so the fact that we were able to work well with the Hill and, uh, and obtain legislation that well, we can sort of right size our controls on satellites, I think is, is a good example of the good working relations I think that we have with the Hill. Mm -hmm. So we plan to that going forward. And also, just keep in mind that uh, for our community, we have 11 committees of jurisdiction. So, uh, so it has been challenging, but at the same time, we have been uh, making an effort to do outreach for all of our oversight committees to keep them fully informed. Now, I think it, it helped by um, tackling sort of, I'll call them low-hanging fruit early on in, in developing this methodology and this process and doing things like tanks, military vehicles before you get to something like satellites. Right. So that the process was well known and understood. Um, and then the expectations were that you would come up as a team and, and talk to them and, and at least let them air their concerns, if not, you know, find a, a useful compromise. Um, the last question I have before I'll open it up to the floor is about the outreach program, about publishing proposed rules, feedback that you all have gotten, um, useful, perhaps not as useful, um, but certainly um, the outreach that you've had to the broader community. And we've heard what you've done with the Hill, but I'm curious about um, engaging with industry, as Thomas has talked about, but also sort of other interest areas about I mean, again, there are the full range of people out there, everyone who wants to protect everything all the time, to people who you know, are, are much more restrictive in, in their mindset and in terms of what gets controlled. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about the outreach program and how that will continue as you move through the rest of phase two and into phase three? Again, knowing that you have a lot on your plate. Yeah. But well, it's, it's a critical part of what we do for a living. We have an old office of outreach. Uh, I, I hold a weekly conference call. Every Wednesday at 2.30, I answer whatever question has come in. Sometimes it may take a week or two, but you know we're trying to be open that way. And if I can't go and visit everybody, at least anybody can dial in, have their question asked and answered, and then everybody else will hear it as well. Um, uh, 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 I, the, the group, the interagency group, had given literally several hundred speeches over the, co over the course of the year. I think this is my 342nd appearance. I mean, we're, <laughs> no, I'm not exaggerating. Counting. We're actually we're open uh, as much as we can. Um, uh, uh, if you have a good idea, we will listen to it. Uh, we're constantly seeking, uh, you know, input from industry. With every one of the rules we've published, proposed, asking for lots and lots of comment, both from the public and from our technical advisory groups and states, defense trade advisory group. Uh, in several of the categories, uh, we went out twice with proposed rule just to get um, and, and other aspects of the reg. You know, this is what we did in response to your comments. Does it still make sense? Is it clear? Does it accomplish the objectives? And then we would review all those comments by we, I mean all of the agencies, we'd meet down at the Defense Department for literally weeks on end, going through every public comment line by line and saying, that's very clever, we're going to adopt it, that's loopy, we're going to ignore it. Um, uh, uh, or the fact that you asked the question suggested that you didn't understand what we wrote, so we needed to edit it. And so, you know, it's not just outreach for the sake of outreach, it's outreach and we're actually listening and taking it into effect because uh, you know, we're clever and good, but we can't possibly anticipate every possible circumstance. That's why we, we want to hear about it. So it's a core element. I think in terms of numbers, I think we doubled, even with a smaller budget, we doubled the number of people that we reach. We at Commerce last year, 17,000 individuals um, uh, just with our, our public outreach uh, efforts, which was, uh, you know, more than the previous year. And that's going to, we're going to try to increase that this year. It, it might be useful just to give you a feel for the kinds of public comments we get. For category 11, which yeah. is military electronics, I think we got nearly 80 pages of comments for both the ITAR and the EAR. 80 pages, 12 font, single space <laughs> comments. Uh, as you might imagine, we didn't breeze through that in a half Actually, hour. that's just the summary. The 80 pages yeah, was the summary. summary yeah. so. so we we spent, I think, no fewer than four or five sessions, full day, eight hour sessions at DITSA in Alexandria. Uh, from about 8.30 in the morning till 5, 5.30 at night, going through those comments. So we take everyone to heart individually. We look at them, they, they, get, they get a round the horn. There's usually about 20, 30 people in the room having a discussion. Um, it can be um, pretty rigorous and, um, uh, and pretty tiring sometimes, intellectually tiring. But, it's, but, but I think what I'm trying to say here is we're trying to assure the audience that we really do look at these things hard and give them due consideration. Second thing that we do that, that, that I would also like to mention is we also bring in industry and help us actually figure out what it is the control should be and help us write the control. Now, I'm thinking of a, an issue yesterday, it was, it was Vossenar, it wasn't, wasn't our control regulations, but it, we do similar kinds of things where we actually were on a telephone call with industry trying to figure out what the quintessence of the thing that we were trying to control was and then through a group collaborative effort we worked through what that control ought to be uh, such that industry was satisfied that we weren't overreaching and they could live with what we had and we had something we thought controlled what we wanted to and control. And for the AP lawyers in the audience, he's referring to our technical advisory committees, which are back approved, so. Right. Great. Well, thank you all for answering my questions. Um, we have about 25 minutes. I'm going to try to end at 11.30 and I ask your forgiveness and patience with that. Um, we're actually gonna take two questions at a time. If you could raise your hand, if I call on you, uh, introduce yourself and your affiliation if you have one, and please ask a question um, if, there, if you can. Um, I appreciate that. And then um, we have mic runners in the back, so I'll call on this lady up front first, followed by this gentleman in the second row. Is that you, Yuda? Did you point to Yuda? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> we want the web to capture okay. you. I'm Yuta well. uh, Henig from Inside US Trade. Wanted to follow up on Mr. Hoffman's. Um, 
point on the uh, single license application to Mr. Nielsen and Ms. Wolf. Is there uh, inner agency consensus on that? And what's the timeline? What's the status of that effort? And is, sure that, uh, is that something that can be done uh, administratively? And then a question to Mr. Wolf also in follow up. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how commerce will address export enforcement in the context of getting on to U.S. exports? Okay. And the second question from this gentleman, would you mind? Um, there you go. Right, thank you. Uh, Jim Berger, Washington Trade Daily. Just a brief question. Do you have any timelines uh, on when the satellites and the military electronics uh, will be published? Um, Actually, let's take the second question first because it's, it's simple, right? Uh, soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're next. Uh, you know, our whole schedule was blown up last year as a result of the furloughs and the sequestration. So everything we said last year it, it was shot. And I can go into the reasons, but the collateral impacts were far greater than the 16 days because, as Tim said, we get 30 people in a room and having them all clear their schedules, uh, it's difficult when you know, they're being furloughed or when the government is shut down. Um, so, uh, uh, like excuse me? They like your answer. They like my <laughs> answer in the next room. <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, we're, we're finished with the public the review of the public comments on both 15 and 11. We're going to be starting as soon as we can uh, the congressional notification process for each. I don't have exact dates. I'm not going to give you exact dates, but those are the first two in our queue. Um, uh, above all other categories. So, you know, we're talking about the spring um, and early summer for each of the categories on 1511. That's satellites and military electronics. And, and satellites will be first. Yeah. I mean, it's ahead, of, it's ahead of electronics, and then electronics will follow. Yeah. And I think Tim wanted to start answering the On first the single agency? I mean, the single uh, form. So, much like phase three work, um, U.S. exports is working in phases two. And job number one right now, the wolf closest to the door, is to get commerce up and running <laughs> on I their system. And, and, and commerce has um, additional requirements over and above those that that state had. So it, my guess is it's going to take us anywhere from 60 to 90 days to get, get commerce where they need to be so that we can do all our Indian testing and then get them brought up online. Then the, in the meantime, as we get toward the end of that, we have to define requirements for what that portal looks like and what the license is going to be. So do we have consensus on that yet? No, we have not started the work. But if, if the work proceeds like it has with um, developing commerces and state system in the past, we will sit down in a room, we'll develop the, we'll, we'll develop the requirements, we'll come to a consensus on what those requirements look like and what's entailed. That will require us to do a cost analysis and a work analysis as we do that. Um, and my sense is, is that's, that's not terribly difficult, but there's not complete agreement on that, that point of view. And that work probably will not begin probably till the summer, maybe early fall. And then the issue is, can we, in, in today's austere budget environment, can we find money uh, to do that work? We think we can. We certainly have the support of the Secretary of Defense on this, and he's been willing to, um, we've been, been able to get money for this kind of work in the past. Um, but that's all before us at this stage of the game. So, so to sum up, we want to get a portal. We want to make it easier for industry. We want to make this as transparent and as easy as we possibly can. Um, first job, as I've learned in planning, is to figure out what the problem is and what the requirements are before you start you know, start bidding metal and cutting things. Yeah. When you say requirements, the requirements for the board or the requirements for the single? The, the IT for side. both. Well, for both. The re you, you, in order to do the coding for the system, you have to understand what it is, the processes, and what it is you're trying to do, and to understand how we're going to work both with the state and the commerce systems as we work through the IT system. And that's, that's different than how we've done business in the past. And so all that process has to be laid out, and then we, have, we define the requirements around those processes, and then we, then we lay out the work and the money tied to that. And on your question on U.S. exports and export enforcement, what Tim was referring to is just a way in which to allow for the single database to work through our enforcement structure. That's all it was. It was just another part of the Commerce Department with access visibility, and, uh, which is no different institutionally than what we do now in terms of having an enforcement clearance of applications, but just working them into with their enforcement issues uh, into, the, into the IT structure. So it's, it's an all IT comment. With us as well, Homeland Security. And home, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, the woman in the green shirt, and then followed by the woman sitting right in front of her. Good morning. And Charlotte Merle Vetevi from uh, the Center for International Trade and Security. Two, hopefully, very quick questions. 
First, a question about the correlation between the new conventional arms transfer policy and how that will work practically with the lists. Will the new office in, at Commerce, in particular, uh, work with the 600 Sears in that aspect, use the policy that yeah, way? Uh, the second question might be a little bit trickier, and uh, I'm just curious to see how uh, the message of the reform or the, the consequences of the reform will be lifted into an international context, in particular with regards to the Vasna arrangement. Because in the globalized supply chain, you have a lot of international partners that will look at the lists that have inspired the US lists, or vice versa, and they will be still stuck in, uh, in the old way of controlling things. So will there be a new uh, push into the Vasana and uh, the likes of them uh, for reform there? Thank you. I, I hear someone that. arguing for a phase four here. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. And then the woman. No, Actually, the woman behind, yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Lumpy at the Open Society Foundations and the Open Society Policy Center. Uh, thanks so much for putting this on. I had a question. Uh, Jones Day reported in September 2013 that one of the inadvertent consequences of the uh, shifting of items from the USML to the CCL was that the prohibition on procurement from, from Chinese companies uh, was being gutted uh, effectively every time uh, more, more commodities are transferred over to commerce. So I wondered um, how you were going to deal with that. Uh, as they put it in their brief, the ECR will promote the transfer of production and loss of jobs to China in particular as defense suppliers will be free to procure numerous Chinese manufactured goods that had previously been prohibited by Section 1211 of the NDA of 2006. And more generally, I wondered if you could speak to how labor and small contractors, uh, small subcontractors are viewing uh, these changes and how they're being factored into uh, the, the process. Okay. I'm going to turn to our State Department colleague to answer the first set of questions on the conventional arms transfer policy and the message of reform in taking uh, the U.S. as a kind of a standard bearer and helping an international dialogue. Thanks. Uh, first of all, with respect to how the CAP policy is, is going to work uh, in the items that we're moving over to, to CCL, uh, we've alre we're already putting in place uh, a system working uh, in partnership with, uh, with Commerce and various bureaus in the State Department to make sure that the CAP policy uh, um, is, is applied to all of, uh, all of these items. The way uh, it works specifically is that the uh, Commerce Department will send uh, the applications that it gets through the 600 series to a point of contact uh, in the State Department. It's actually not in my bureau. It's in the, uh, a sister bureau, the Bureau of uh, International Security and Nonproliferation. And that is kind of the, the, the single point of contact at State, which uh, then takes a look at the applications and looks at uh, kind of the various parameters that other bureaus in the State Department with an interest uh, uh, in uh, specific countries or specific policies. Um, and if uh, it hits one of those flags, then um, the case is uh, sent to that bureau for comment. Uh, one of the bureaus is, is uh, my bureau, the Political Military Bureau, but other bureaus in the State Department that are involved in that are, uh, are uh, DRL, which uh, does uh, uh, human rights. Uh, as well as uh, the regional bureaus in the State Department, uh, which have a particular interest, uh, for example, in uh, you know, uh, regional security matters um, or, uh, uh, or country-specific uh, con uh, concerns. Hum um, so uh, we already have in place this system, and I'm happy to, uh, to tell uh, all of you that uh, for the categories that uh, already have been uh, transferred, or for the items that have already been transferred uh, to the Commerce Department, we're already kind of up and running and uh, implementing that system. So again, for all the items, whether they're uh, covered under the USML or the CCL, uh, the CAP policy, uh, which was just updated and announced by the White House last month and is available uh, in a fact sheet uh, for everybody on, on the web, is still going to be kind of our north star in uh, in how we uh, in how we oversee this this process. On the Vassenar question, um, remember we're not removing from military controls anything that's on the Vassenar munitions list. Basically, all we've done unilaterally you know, is to split up between the State Department and the Commerce Department 
uh, that which is within the scope of the Vossidar munitions list. The Vossidar munitions list still uses those broad catch-all phrases, all parts and components especially designed for military items. That's it. That was the scope on the parts and components controls. Uh, so we're, and we're not allowing for the unlicensed export of anything that would be on the Vossidar munitions list outside the Vossidar members. Uh, so in that sense, that's why we haven't done anything inconsistent with our loss and our uh, uh, commitments in that regard. Um, and with respect to dual use items, we're still going through the annual review of the Voss and our list where all these things occur multilaterally. Um, uh, but uh, what has happened in terms of going through and spending all this time thinking about what warrants the most significant controls, that is actually sort of fed into our expertise on recommendations that we make to Voss and our. Uh, absolutely, but we're not actually changing the scope of controls outside the Vossenar arrangement for anything that today is within the scope of the Vossenar munitions list. I think that answered your question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, If I could, just for those on the web, um, it, the question really is about how it's controlled and not necessarily um, what Mr. Wolf recently just said, but about how, it, how it's done. And, and I think your comment that you are feeding that into the Wassadar recommendations process. Sure. Is, well, there is part of it, right? It's part of the technical analysis that then feeds into our recommendations to Wassadar, yes. Yeah. But in terms of the larger defense trade exercise, we've deliberately kept it so that between the USML and the 600 series, that's yeah. essentially the scope of what's on the Boston Army. So you're not u unilaterally. We're not unilaterally. Doing things to Boston precisely. Army. Right. Um, and the, the second set of questions was really about the, the China prohibitions found in the fiscal year 2006 and DAA. Um, yeah, Brian, yeah you want and, to and I'll address that, that Laura. That, that's a very good question. So I appreciate your asking it. Uh, for everyone's context, uh, there's a prohibition in the National Defense Authorization Act from fiscal year 2006 uh, that prohibits uh, DOD's procurement system from procuring any item that's, uh, that would be comparable to items that we control in the U.S. munitions list from being procured from China, from Chinese sources. And so uh, the question that Laura's asked that has been raised is, uh, is that because we're moving uh, the less sensitive military items to the Commerce List of the 600 series, does that take them, or does that make them now available for the DOD procurement system? And the answer to that is no. Uh, the reason being is, is because we've actually harmonized uh, the licensing policies for the total and partial arms embargoes that state has in the ITAR at 126.1. We have harmonized our licensing policies for the 600 series and the commerce list to adopt those ex exact same prohibitions. And in fact, we've actually tightened it. So as a result of moving over, we've actually made more items subject to that prohibition than was previously subject. And that's because we've taken the items that are in the, uh, in the ECC and the Export Control Classification Numbers that end in 018. Those are the military items, uh, both military end items, uh, like the Humvees and, uh, and certain like training air, uh, uh, aircraft, and military aircraft that moved back in the early enough. 1990s by President Bush. Uh, we've consolidated all of those and put those inside the 600 series as well. And so those are now coming subject to those for the first time. So um, administratively, we would like legislation that's the neatest and cleanest thing to fix the statute. Um, we've been, been in discussions with the Hill about that. Um, to, since the prohibition basically is maintained by policy, but the neatest and cleanest thing would be to actually amend uh, that section, that provision in the NDAA from 2006. And so we're working to do that. So just to provide better clarity and transparency to industry. And on your small company question, um, uh, it, it, uh, you know, the small companies, they were some of the biggest advocates of the change and some of the companies that are the most afraid of the change. Um, uh, when, for example, we went out and were asking for what the effective date should be, uh, you know, a lot of small companies' response was, all of my products are moving off of the USML. I won't have to deal with registration fees or licensing fees or MLAs or TAAs, and all of my trade is with the NATO countries. Anyway, this is terrific. Can you make it happen yesterday? 
Um, and that was a very common small company reaction to the topics that we proposed. Another common small company reaction is, oh my God, I don't have the resources to think through all the changes. I, my entire compliance program was just changing the name and the date uh, of a license application and sending it into state, and that's all I knew how to do. And we get that, we understood that, and it, we realized that it is going to be difficult for those companies, but as I said earlier, um, and that's why we're, with the outreach effort, really trying to focus to the extent resources permit on those small companies to get them more comfortable with the new system. So far, with those that have gotten over the hump of understanding the paradigm shift, it works very well. And in fact, a lot of the changes are directed at making things for this type of regular supply chain trade for smaller companies uh, a lot more efficient. But I do acknowledge that there's going to be a significant transition difficulty uh, for them to work through. Right. Any, Next, that, I'm sorry. Anything else, Tom? Or? Oh, you look like that. The next two questions will be the woman in front of our Open Society friend, and then this gentleman up here to my left. Hi, I'm Andrea Shalal, Issa with Reuters, and I wanted to ask you about a question. The, when we talk to folks in the defense industry, what they frequently talk about is the sort of angst around ITAR-free you know, satellites, and I know you're addressing that now. But um, what, they, what, what we often hear is that they're concerned that the missile technology control regime is going to, uh, in effect, result in a similar type of situation on unmanned vehicles. And I wonder if each of you could pretend, you know, just address that and how, to what extent the... Um, I, I know you're talking here about process, but I'm kind of more interested in the sort of policy piece behind it. Sure. Um, and just to sort of piggyback on the previous question about Chinese parts, you know, um, Frank Kendall has had to issue a series of waivers for these tiny, you know, dumb parts as they were described to me. You know, they don't have a chip, they can't be programmed, there can't be a, you know, sleeper cell, you know, thing that's mysteriously found its way under the F-35, but nonetheless, it's in violation of the law, it has to be waived. And given your, what you're seeing about the global supply chain, I'm just wondering if you can address those sort of parts and whether you think the law needs to be changed to exempt dumb parts. Well, those parts countries. have parents, too, so don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then the second question up here. Up here, the sorry, in the front row. One and you, parts question. Uh, thank you. Um, Peter Lichtenbaum with Covington and Berlin, and thanks to all of you for the attention that this issue is getting and the hard work that you and your staffs have put in. A um, couple questions, both of which are, I think, for Secretary Kelly, but Secretary Wolf may care to comment as well. Um, one, following up on Ann Charlotte's question about uh, Vosnar, um, as Secretary Wolf has commented previously, the Vosnar obligations that the United States has limits the United States' ability to move items off the dual-use list because we are internationally committed to maintaining those controls. Yet it doesn't seem, as, as Anne Charlotte suggested, that there's been a really significant focus to try to reform the Vosnar list and other regime lists that the U.S. is bound by. Um, yes, we participate in these in the regular um, list review exercises at Bosnia, we make proposals, but uh, that work, which is led by your sister bureau, ISN, um, seems like it could benefit from a more focused, high-level strategic approach that would really say, look, these are, this is what the U.S. thinks these regimes ought to be covering, and take into account the um, evolution of technology since those lists were created. So I appreciate your comments on uh, whether state would lead that kind of broad strategic level review of the regime coverage. And secondly, um, when Secretary Gates uh, rolled out the Export Control Initiative, he spoke uh, rather eloquently about the fact that if we've licensed a platform, we shouldn't be requiring hundreds or even thousands of licenses for parts that go along with that platform. Yet, uh, arguably, for many platforms, that's still the case even after export control reform because while much has moved to commerce, there are many parts for platforms that remain on the ITAR and ought to remain on the ITAR. And so the, the question is, um, will state consider uh, 
reform of how it licenses, not what's covered on the ITAR, but how it licenses what is on the ITAR, so that we don't have this situation that Secretary Gates expressed concern about, where we have, in many cases, hundreds or even thousands of licenses for important international programs, which end up costing the taxpayer and industry. Thank you. Right, depending on how quickly we can answer these questions, um, we have time for one more, but I just I leave that with our panelists. Uh, so the first question was on satellites and, and on that. So I'll do that one and we'll divvy the rest of it. Uh, the MTCR, um, the Missile Technology Control Regime, uh, the way we've implemented it in the new regs is that all of these exceptions that we're talking about don't apply. Uh, there's a carve out for all MTCR items, no, no the license exception STA, for example, for NATO. Uh, and the reason for that is there's a statutory prohibition on the use of exceptions for those types of exports for those items. Uh, and as you mentioned, your comment was with respect to commercial space flight, for which the same prohibitions apply. Uh, so um, as you'll see, eventually we're going to say, yes, this is a topic worthy of discussion, but it's going to be one of those things that over time requires a much bigger discussion than just the administration is going to involve uh, a need to involve Congress as well. But so for now, everything that we're doing we're trying to update the MTCR references on the USML, USML, in fact, making them more specific and identifying which ones are actually MT controlled. We're doing the same thing and updating them on the commerce control list. But in terms of change of licensing policy, uh, that hasn't really been part of our effort given the statutory issues. So uh, yes, it needs to be discussed. Uh, no, it's not something we're changing now. There, how's that? Excellent. Okay. Um, it's, it's all true, too. <laughs> it has a benefit. It has that side benefit. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> um, all right, and what was the next one? Tim, did you want to talk about Chinese Ch dumb Ch parts? Ch Chinese parts, dumb parts. Oh, right. Um, right now, uh, parts tied to the JSF, the F-35, are all captured, swept up by ITAR. What we had an issue here was a, a company farming out work to a subsidiary, um, perhaps not according to the licensing processes uh, by, by Hoyle, given what the restrictions of the license were. It, it, whatever reason, it got farmed out to a company in China that manufactured these parts. Right, we discovered this after the fact. And so immediately, um, we identified that, it talked to the company in question, and they have moved their, op they moved their operations, understanding this, back into the United States so that they become compliant again. Um, and uh, and the issue here, in my mind, is not so much an ECR issue, because we're, we're still dealing with the old form of the regulations. This is a licensing issue and making sure that you're staying under the constraints of the license that was issued to you and making sure that everybody understands when you pass work through a company, what it's for, who, you know, and, and who's making it, such that, such that when, you, uh, when you make it, you're not, you're not in violation of the ITAR. So, what we did is we made an exception for these parts, and they were, they were used at such time, we had to because we were going to shut down production of the J-35, literally. So Secretary Kendall made a decision to go ahead and, and use those parts after everybody decided they were not going to be, a pro be problematic, and then at such time when they when we got our production lined up up to snuff in, in the United States, then we would begin replacing those parts. So, so that's kind of the history of this. So the, la the larger issue here, of course, is parts and components, and, and, and the truth be known, Category 8, for several aircraft, the parts and components are swept up with the aircraft involved. And the J-35 is our most advanced, most advanced aircraft in the world, and we're very much concerned about parts and components being, being manufactured anywhere other than what, what we've agreed on with our partners in this, uh, in this, uh, in this project. Actually, Tim, do you also want to talk, um, our second um, question had to do a little bit with components that are going to remain on the on ITAR. And going back to what Secretary Gates said um, in his initial ta talk in um, April of 2010 about making sure that there, there's a holistic approach. Um, and so making it easier on one component um, to get a license versus others that are, are necessary for that component to function. Can you talk a little bit about that or is that something maybe Tom might want to talk about? Well, um, uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll give it a stab and then I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Tom and, and, and Kevin if you want to chime in. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I really fully understand the question, but, but, but as, I, as I understand the question, um, we are trying increasingly um, from, from a defense point of view is when a license comes through and we've approved an aircraft, the, 
generally speaking, our concurrences or our, our review of those licenses take much less time, and we pass those things back into, sta into state um, to, to, to help expedite those, those licenses. We have a, what we call a triage process, because uh, we see about 60,000 licenses a year between commerce and, and state, um, and those kinds of licenses typically uh, go very quickly because there's a precedent, number one, the, the end, end item has been, uh, been okay. Number two is we understand who it's going to and what the part is. And so generally speaking, because there's a precedent in place, they move very quickly from a, a defense point of view. So we're, we're trying not to be the, the so-called toad in the road on this one right now. So that's, that's kind of how we play in this role right now. So let me follow up on the ITAR components question uh, first. I mean, first of all, I think uh, we've got a very good track record in trying to get away from a focus on components and focusing on uh, kind of a, a system focus and especially on, on what really matters uh, for, uh, for, for U.S. defense. And believe me, I mean, we, we at the State Department and the Political Military Bureau, we have no motivation to, like, keep control of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of different military components uh, because we just don't have the staff to, like, control and, uh, and review every single thing. We want to make sure that our staff is focused on the items and systems that are most important in making sure that the U.S. military continues to have a military edge, and that's what, that's what we want to, uh, to focus on. That said, the fact that uh, our North Star is going to be making sure that we preserve U.S. Uh, uh, qualitative military advantage, and that is kind of the, the fundamental factor in making a determination on whether something stays on the U uh, USML or, or not. If we feel that a specific component uh, has, has an effect on that, that uh, edge, on that advantage, then, then we're going to keep it on the list. But believe me, we're very motivated uh, to try to streamline these, these lists as, uh, as much as possible. And uh, you know, if, if your firm's interested in particular uh, items, we'll be very happy to, to hear your perspective on it. Uh, on Wassenaar, I'm not going to speak uh, in great detail right now, so we can get one more question. Uh, let me just say, I mean, first of all, this whole export control reform process is, uh, taking place under the conventional arms uh, transfer policy. We look at a lot of different factors in that, one of which obviously are our multilateral uh, obligations, including our obligations in arms control and nonproliferation uh, agreements, including uh, Wassenaar. We're working very closely uh, with our sister bureau of ISN uh, to make sure that export control reform is consistent uh, with, with our multilateral uh, obligations. Uh, but, um, you know, we're trying to strike the right balance, but it, it's kind of a multivariate analysis and it's a uh, it's very complex, and we'll continue to, uh, to talk to them and other people who are interested in those issues to make sure that we get it right. Unfortunately, we, are, we have run out of time, so. Um, How about one more, Stephanie? We've got more? a CSIS alumni in the back. Maybe we can get Well, then here. I can't stand in the way of that. Right. Um, if you could wait for a microphone real quick. Thanks. My name is Tamora. I work at uh, the New America Foundation's Open Technology Institute, and I have a question with regard to the changes that were announced um, through Wassenaar in December regarding new controls relating to intrusion software and surveillance technology, and in addition to that, the Section 940 of the NDAA uh, requesting the President to develop recommendations on the control of the proliferation of cyber weapons. Um, how, do the two how will the two processes move forward, and how do they relate to the export control reform process? Thank you. Um, on the Vossenar submission, or the Vossenar issue, as we do with all agreements that the U.S. has agreed to at Vossenar, we will be implementing in the Export Administration regulations at some point when we finish the clearance. The only issue is if we de need to do any sort of interpretational notes or something like that to make uh, what was agreed to in Vossenar more clear. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. We will be implementing that which we agreed to at Vossenar as soon as we get the Vossenar 2013 regulation, probably sometime this spring out. And regarding the NDAA requirement for a presidential sort of determination, I, not determination, I can't remember what the language was particularly, but it was a report on yeah, it, it potential re for cyber weapons, It requires right? the president to establish a pro an interagency process to review, right. to determine what should be controlled, and then there's a report into that process. And so we actually have already have an internal interagency process going to look at that. 
uh, and actually had already been stood up as part of considering the boss at our proposals. Um, and so we have that in train already. And so, um, so to be able to meet, we would, we will be dual use to, 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 to try to use the pun, but um, uh, we'll be able to fulfill the reporting requirement for the work we've already been doing to date uh, as part of the, as the boss at our review. Well, it's been my pleasure to, to host this panel, to moderate this panel, but I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Jim, um, for any closing remarks or to ask for applause from the audience. Over no, all I, all I can remember from negotiating the Boston Harvest is to remember to say Mitch Schlag whenever I ordered coffee. So, <laughs> it, and I'm glad to hear it's gotten better since then because it sure wasn't good when I was doing it. <laughs> but this has been a great panel. The fact that you've all stayed and that Stephanie's done a good job is really a tribute to both the expertise on the floor there and to your, uh, your interest in the subject. I wish we had more time. Um, please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.